Hi, and welcome to our next presentation on today's ABG Sundal Collier Investor Days. Our next company presenting is uh, Fluoguide. Um, uh, me, myself, uh, my name is uh, Jacob Lemke. I'm an equity research analyst here covering the healthcare space. And uh, with that, I leave over the word to uh, CEO Morten Albrechtsen. Thank you for the introduction and, and welcome to the presentation of uh, Flu Guide. So what we do at Flu Guide is that we maximize the surgical outcome by intelligent uh, targeting. And if I may have the next two slides, uh, please. Uh, first, a disclaimer, and then um, really what we, uh, what we are doing is that uh, in Flu Guide, we started out focusing in on the oncology surgery. And every year, there's about uh, 15 million patients uh, that has cancer. And about 80% um, of them will need surgery sometimes during the uh, during the, the surgery. And um, the problem with that is that uh, the surgeon really have hard time to see where the cancer stop and the normal tissue start. And what we do basically is that we light up the cancer so the surgeon can remove all cancer the first time. We had here in October, we had uh, the result of our first uh, trial with our first study uh, product. And uh, really it was demonstrated that FG1 uh, was safe and well tolerated and come more into that. We have a strong basis, IP protection. We are listed on First North in, in Stockholm and we have a market of about a billion and we have a course functional team uh, taking all the, the disciplines around. And um, I'm gonna show you some, some pictures from the surgery and if I may have the next slide. Um, what you can see here is really in a nutshell what we are doing. I mean, on the left side, you have an, an, an cancer um, or a brain uh, with the cancer and it's what the surgeons see when they put aside uh, the doer that is covering the brain on the left side. And what you see in the middle with the with the green arrow is the cancer. And for no surgeon, this is uh, easy to see that this is cancer. The problem then starts when they have removed the cancer. And now, now they have to make the decision if they should remove some more tissue uh, with the risk that they could potentially disable the patient. They could take uh, some of the function for the speech or for the, for the movements or they should leave uh, it behind with the risk that the cancer will regrow after surgery. And this is a problem the surgeon is faced with every day. And if it were you, I mean, if you want to have a product that uh, could light up cancer, I'm sure you would. And if you have the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, not the next, oh, yeah, next slide, sorry. Um, then you can see how actually it works very, very well for this first patient. If the one on the left side um, is demonstrated that the, when the neurosurgeon checked this uh, cavity after she had removed the cancer, she could see that something was left in the bottom of the cavity. And she removed that uh, part of, of, the, of the tissue as well that uh, was lighting up. And uh, it was, of course, checked with uh, a pathologist uh, and that actually were cancer. And then on the right side of the back images, this is, uh, this is the image after she had removed it. And you can see that there's no one, not, nothing left. And this is really what we are doing. And it's clear for everyone that this is really, if you would have a surgery in your, your brain or everywhere else, you really would like to have it all removed with this extra security for, for the nose surgeon. And of course, also the nose surgeon is quite pleased with having an extra tool helping them in, in taking the very hard decision they are faced with in the middle of the surgery. So this is what we're doing. The rest of the slide is how we are executing on it. Uh, so if I may have the next uh, slide, please. Um, this is a, an overview of our, our procedure. It's a very simple procedure and yet with quite a profound impact. The product is injected into, uh, into the vein of the patient prior to surgery. It will circulate in the body and it will bind to cancer. Then uh, after it's, it's bound to the cancer, it will be removed from the background and then it will be left uh, just uh, marking up the cancer during surgery. So the procedure is really simple and then it can be used uh, during surgery. One of the neat thing with flu guide is that everyone really likes us. I mean, the patient, obviously, because we help them remove all the cancer the first time. Hospital could potentially save cost in uh, um, that they should not have a re-surgery. The surgeon likes it because they get a more secure, um, what do you say, a tool that will help them doing their work better. And the equipment manufacturers also likes us, which is quite important because they um, we take their technical feature and convert them into benefit, and they have a quite strong interest in in seeing us uh, being successful. So, if I may have the next slide, please. Um, this is an overview of uh, what we are targeting on on the cancer. We we're targeting an an uh, proteolytic protein. It's an it's an enzyme uh, that's called UPA, sitting on on the top of the cells uh, on the forefront of the cancer. It's a quite an interesting one because it's what the cancer uses when they when they want to invade into the normal tissue. It will use UPAR to break down 
uh, cancer, as a normal tissue, so the cancer can invade into, into the normal tissue. It's quite an extraordinary good target in a way that it's very specific for, for, for cancer. So it means that uh, it will only be in practical terms expressed on the cancer. It's also extensively expressed, so it means that patients do not have to have screening. They can just be enrolled directly into, into the uh, use of uh, this tool. Uh, it's uh, particularly expressed on the forefront of the cancer, meaning that's exactly where, where the neurosurgeon would like it, because that's where it's difficult to see where the cancer stop and the normal tissues start. It's also proportion, proportionally with aggressivity of the cancer. So the more aggressive the cancer is, the more it will spread and the more u part it will express and the better it is to see for the for the neurosurgeon. So um, we have next slide. So we think that it's quite an extraordinary um, um, target we have uh, we have selected. The next then big thing really is uh, and that's an issue for us of course because we can we have a luxury problem in the sense that we can go into multiple different indications and. Um, we have chosen uh, two. We have chosen aggressive brain cancer as one because that will give us quickly to uh, to the market. We have also selected the lung cancer because that's an, an quite large uh, clinical potential uh, in, in this indication. So that is the two indications we have uh, we have chosen. So if I may have the next slide, please. So the next thing that is very neat with Blue Guide is that we have very short paths uh, to the market. And um, the main reason for that is that we need quite small uh, studies in number of patients, and the patients have to be included quite a short time into our, our trials. And really what, what is needed in the trials, and that goes from now the whole way up to, uh, to approval, and that is the patient is enrolled into the into this trial. Uh, the neurosurgeon will do the surgery as, as you saw on the images before on the white light. They will switch on the fluorescent light and they will check if they have removed everything. And then if you remove something more, it will be sent to the pathologist for final evaluation. Um, there will be, principally, we are now doing the one phase slash two study. And then there will be a phase three study that is needed, confirmatory. Uh, uh, and that's it. Then we'll have an, an uh, approval um, or submission time in 24 and then approval uh, 25. Um, if I may have the next slide, please. So the study we have ongoing right now, where we have the result here in uh, in, in October, demonstrate uh, that uh, the product FG1 is uh, safe, uh, generally speaking, and that is uh, quite effective in, uh, in in illuminating this aggressive brain cancer. It was a study, it was a classical uh, drug uh, trial where we increased the dose, and we have that in eight cohorts. And um, we have now, we was not limited by toxicity. We could either be limited by toxicity or by um, um, by that we do not get further improvement in the image. So we were not uh, limited in toxicity and we did not expect so because we have um, chosen a flu form that is known to be very well tolerated. We also have uh, had an extensive uh, preclinical safety uh, program uh, carried out and also demonstrated that uh, the product is uh, really safe and well tolerated. We were not limited by uh, toxicity in these uh, animal studies. We were limited by feasibility. So for us, it was not a surprise that it was safe, but still it's quite important um, because also it was a very clean profile and it means that we can use it uh, also in a more lighter uh, types of cancer. Um, the important thing for us were that uh, we also saw that it was uh, lighting up cancer. And that is really great because we see a quite strong uh, contrast uh, created between the cancer and the background. And that means it's so strong actually that it can be used across different uh, equipment. So even a poor equipment actually will uh, illuminate the cancer very nicely with our technology. We also see that it is the, it's the weight of the patient independent. It's also some of the cancers have a more uh, generally speaking, is it can light up more than others, but we see in all of the cancers so very good homogeneity across cancers. So really, really good and strong basis uh, we can uh, we have can build on. We have um, then have to select the optimal time, and we have two times: we have the evening before and then the morning. Uh, that is carry on carry on right now. And when we have to co coming into Q1, we will start the the formal second part of the study, which will be really exactly the same as we did here in the first one, but in 12 patients with the same dose. And this is designed uh, to be uh, similar to the phase three study we anticipate. And uh, we use those data here to go to FDA and EMEA to ask for buy-in on on a on a regulatory uh, supportive uh, trials for um, for the phase three. So if I have the next one, um, we will have the data for the second part of the study. We will have them in uh, mid of next year. An important thing by having completed the first part of it is that the safety part now is completed 
And that means we can go into every indication we would like to principally. We don't have to have this more rigid uh, safety setup. And that means that it's much easier for us to carry on the long, long study. But we could also go into to other indications. If I may have the next one, please. So this is uh, then an overview of, of our pipeline. We have uh, the high-grade glioma um, uh, as a lead indication. We have the lung cancer as a second indication. We have then uh, the mini glioma and uh, low-grade glioma. That's really supportive to aggressive brain cancer. So we're looking uh, from the data we had, there was a few patients that did not have uh, glioblastoma, the high-grade glioma, and they had other uh, brain cancer. And actually, our technology also lightened up those cancer as we expected, but of course, it was, was nice to see. So it's not only a product for high-grade glioma, it's actually a, a product for uh, brain cancer. And that we want to demonstrate with this study to broad out the brain cancer indications. Um, then we have a second product that is uh, being uh, been initiated in development. It's uh, basically it's the difference is that it's um, going for the lower part of the body, uh, and it's also a UPART targeted product. Uh, and then they have some uh, some other uh, uh, small uh, features with it that uh, make it um, distinct with uh, lighting off when you can see cancer deeper into the tissue and, and so on. An important thing with the first FT1 is that we have this photothermal therapy that is that we can heat up the product. And in about a third percent of the cases uh, for brain cancer, the neurosurgeon will leave cancer behind uh, because they cannot remove it all because then they will impair uh, the brain or impair the patient because it take out critical uh, functions. Um, having this photothermal therapy is a possibility that we, during the surgery, can sweep and clean uh, the, the cavity, and that way actually completely uh, 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 treat the patient. So we have a quite nice, it's a focused pipeline, but still it's a quite diverse. We have the quick uh, path to the market with the glibostoma, and we have then the lung cancer with the, with the last potential. If I may have the next slide, please. Thank you. It's an overview of the competitive landscape. and. Um, Right now, there's two products that is approved for for guiding uh, surgery uh, of the first generation products. They are unspecific and and uh, they are on um, uh, unprecise. Uh, basically, they're converted to the fluorescent molecule inside the cancer uh, and they're forming a cloud around the cancer. Um, one of them is for bladder cancer, and the other one is for for brain cancer. And Interestingly, they are based on white light, and that means that you cannot see uh, the fluorescence very deeply into the tissue. But still, uh, they are now approved, have been approved for, for 10 years, and really start to take uh, take uh, on now commercially. It's quite nice because it proved that the, the concept is, is relevant, and um, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, there's quite a potential in this, uh, this market. We have then a range of uh, second-generation products. They are all um, based on near-infrared light. And that means that you can see deeper into the tissue, that you can you can see the cancer uh, really one to two centimeters down into the tissue. And that's very important, for instance, considering the brain, that you really can see the cancer uh, where you couldn't see it with the, with the current product. So it's a dramatic improvement compared to the to first generation products. All of them are based on infrared light. Some of them are equipment dependent, and that means that uh, you could you use uh, special equipment to see it. From our point of view, we have we really decided from the very beginning that we want to stay uh, equipment independent, and that means that we are able to be used for any equipment out there. So we do not have to have special tweaks with the equipment. It's really a plug and play. We can go out, we can use it tomorrow on any equipment that is out on, on the uh, surgical uh, places. And then, of course, our target is, is quite unique in the sense that we have a very cancer-specific uh, product, and then it's cancer type on specific, so we can go into this aggressive cancer, get to the market quickly, and we can broaden out to, to lung cancer. May I have the next one, please? So a third thing that is uh, very neat with flu guide is that we are, have some very supportive trends in the market. In the surgical area, um, it's been increasingly digitalized and uh, minimalized and automated over the years. More equipment is coming into the surgical scene. And uh, we started out in brain for a couple of reasons, and, and one of them as well is that uh, all know surgeon have a microscope. And that means that we don't have to go out and selling microscopes to the neurosurgeons. All of the microscopes out there can see our products, and we don't have to go out to sell upgrades. I mean, it's a straightforward way. And, and really, it's, it's a very much easier penetration than, for instance, a an, an, an type of surgery where you do not have um, so much equipment. But generally speaking, all the large medtech companies now are moving into the field where they um, have microscopes or endoscopes or robotic uh, equipment that can be used to help the surgeon in, in, in the surgery. Um, 
couple of them, three of them to be precise, have acquired a camera because they need all a camera uh, for their for the equipment. So they acquired specific camera, all very neat uh, for guiding surgery. And then really what they're lacking is a flow forward, just like the one uh, we are providing now. And ideally, of course, they will have one that is a uh, cancer type unspecific, uh, but cancer specific. So that will kind of be our expectation in the next wave coming up. Um, if we may have the next slide, please. Um, I can say we're talking with all the, the large uh, companies in, in different ways, uh, of course. Um, and um, this is then the, and, and just a summary of, of our shareholder basis. I mean, we have uh, two, three, four institutional investors into the company right now. Albert and Landsbank were from the very beginning. Link came in uh, just right after our IPO. Uh, then we have um, two others. Uh, one is the Swedish pension fund and then the German bank. We have covers by ABG, SEB and uh, Red Eye. And we have a really nice uh, shareholder basis with about uh, 9,000 uh, shareholders. Um, and um, we have had a very good growth uh, on, on, on development on the, on, the, on the stock exchange. And there's no reason for this not to continue. So if I may have the next slide, please. Um, we have had a the thing that is moving us so fast because of our short clinical trials have also meant that we have had a very steep development. We had an IPO in 19. We were pre-clinical states company. We um, now in, in, in this year have a proof of concept. We have demonstrated that product is safe. We can expand into the more prevalent indication and start up the second product. In 23, just to make an outlook, we'll be a late stage uh, clinical phase three program uh, company. Uh, we have two to three phase two, three programs running in more prevalent indications. Um, so it will be a dramatic change as well uh, going um, two years forward uh, from here. And the, the market is quite interesting. It's large, it's attractive the platform we have. It works and we have a short path to the market. If I may have the next slide, please. Um, we also, because we have so such short clinical trials, we have a quite uh, uh, several uh, very important milestones coming up the next 12 months. So in Q1, we will have the histology data formalized for the first part of the study. Uh, we will have the CCA for the for the lung cancer uh, study. I mean, that's application for starting the clinical trials. We will have in the mid of next year. We will have the end of the phase two part. Um, and we will have the regulatory feedback in Q3 for uh, plan three next year, two FTAs and uh, one with EMEA. And then uh, we have the, in, in Q4, we will have the result of the lung and as well, we'll have a preclinical safety package for, for Q, uh, FT2. We have a couple of uh, milestones we haven't put into uh, precise when they will come, but we'll have the, uh, we'll start the study in this um, to broaden out the potential in, in the brain cancer. We prepare the phase three next year. We're doing all the production already now. And then we will start up the photothermal uh, therapy uh, development. So um, really, in quite a nice and um, and, and, and packed uh, news flow we will come up with. And I think that's the last slide. And I'm very prepared to take pre questions or any discussions. Okay. Um, thank you, Morten. Uh, so we we start with um, on, on your. Uh, Phase one study, you, you have um, uh, treated um, or administered your product to 27 patients and, and you have demonstrated safety. But you also recorded uh, sort of the tumor fluorescence. And, and uh, as we know, uh, tumors fluoresced in, in all of the, the patients at uh, the, the relevant dose. So to what extent is this sort of an indication of, uh, you know, that you're going to perform good results in your upcoming efficacy trials? Yes, thank you for that question. It's a good one. I mean, our efficacy endpoint is coming in, in steps. I mean, the steps we need for approval is uh, what is referred to as positive predictive value. So that means when, when the cancer lights up uh, for the surgeon uh, and sent to the pathologist um, and the pathologist confirm a cancer, then there will be a positive predictive value of our product to determine the, or, or diagnose uh, cancer. And that is the regulatory endpoint. Um, then we come in steps. What we have now is that we have demonstrated the light. So what we can see is that the cancer lights up uh, compared to the background. Uh, we have macroscopically seen that what lights up is cancer. I mean, this is visible for the nose surgeon. And then the step we will have in uh, ENQ1 is that we have um, from, from the patient on, on the relevant uh, dose, we will uh, look at the histology. And that is really um, the same endpoint as we use for regulatory um, uh, purposes that we take the regulatory the histology examination and make that as a truth. 
and then compare it to, to the light. And that will come here in, in Q1 next year. So that's the, the next step. But the fact that we can see it macroscopically is really very, very strong indication of, uh, of an effect. Uh, and uh, during these um, clinical trials, you, you have sort of uh, let uh, let the neurosurgeons, you know, play around with you with your product and experience it. And what sort of feedback have you gotten thus far, or, or yeah. on the potential? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I'm not saying we, we have let the neurosurgeon play around with our <laughs> product as such. Uh, we we um, we are under like uh, quite strict uh, regulation. It's a drug trial, so there's a lot of things you cannot do, and a lot of things you're not allowed to do as you would like to do. Um, but um, the feedback we get, and, and uh, it's mostly coming from, from when, when you have a patient that comes in with high-grade glioma, um, they would uh, not always have high-grade glioma. They're sus suspected to have high-grade glioma, and about 10% of the patient are diagnosed under the surgery not to have high-grade glioma. And we had had uh, two of those patients in a study. One was this mini glioma, that was another brain cancer, and then we have a metastasized, a metastasized coming from, from the lung. Um, the one that has the mini glioma patient, we were able to publish that the data because that this patient had been formally excluded from our trials, and that way we could actually was able to take more uh, samples from it because she was uh, doing that during the surgery, which we could also publish. So the feedback we got from from, from this patient is, and, and the feedback in general is that she's really uh, very enthusiastic about what she see, uh, in the sense that they really light up very nicely, and actually it can potentially guide her. In, in, in checking the cavity as, uh, as shown on the images, where after the surgery is done, she looked at the cavity and she can actually remove more cancer in case it lights up, of course, checking it uh, with the pathologist. So it's a very, um, it's like having a, you know, driving a car in the night and she can switch on the light. So um, she's quite pleased with it. Uh, and, and as you said, uh, a few of the, um, uh, the patients you treated did not have high grade glioma, but other types of, of uh, cancer tumors. And sort of more in general, maybe you could just you know highlight sort of from a scientific perspective why it sort of makes sense that your product will work in in multiple cancer types compared to perhaps some of your competition. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean the target we have chosen is uh, UPA. It is uh, this um, uh, the, the enzyme the cancer used to break down normal tissue. So when a cancer wants to spread into normal tissue, we use UPAR to, to tear it down or destroy it, you can say, so it can get into the normal tissue. And that's why it's a very basic function and all cancer types uh, need this, uh, you say, feature to be able to spread. And uh, basically the UPAR is a tissue remodulation uh, marker um, and that is particularly strong for cancer. So the reason for why it's very likely to work in other cancers is because all cancers are spread, and that is basically the definition of cancers, um, and then would be more than 80% of all solid cancer, they expressed UPAR in the forefront where they spread. So for that reason, it's a very uh, cancer-specific marker, but a cancer type in specific marker. And um, so we did expect that we can see it in, in other cancers. And that's UPAR, the research on UPAR has gone on for a long time. It's not only us that have worked on, on a UPAR such as target. We're the only one using it to guide surgery, but it's used for other purposes as well uh, back in time. So there's a lot of literature on, on where UPAR is expressed and um, how it can work for diagnostic purposes. And also drug treatment has tried, tried to, to, to use UPAR. Um, so UPAR is, is a quite well-described uh, marker in, 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 in literature. And the data we have now also support really what is uh, known already. Interesting. And, and I think we have time for, for a final question. Uh, and um, so, so on your uh, competitive landscape slide, you, you mentioned a few competitors. And, and I believe um, one of them on Target Labs just recently got, the, got their first product approved in, in ovarian cancer. Uh, so maybe you could just sort of highlight uh, what this means for, for you, uh, but also sort of for the uh, fluorescent guided surgery field uh, in general. Yeah, no, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, actually, forgot to, to mention it when, when the slide. That, that's very important, in fact, because um, they are the first of the second generation products that have um, um, a product approved. They have it approved in, in Ohio cancer, as Sarah mentioned. And there's a lot, lot of reason of why this is very important for the whole field. 
But for some of them, is that it validates our regulatory path. It will. Um, they have had a patient, about 300 patients reported the safety, and about 150 patients reported the efficacy. So that gave us a kind of a benchmark of what we could uh, what we could expect. The achievement they got is that one out of four patients only have a benefit of it during surgery, and one out of five patients had normal tissue removed accidentally because it light up normal tissue. So it gives a kind of a benchmark what is needed to get approval. Uh, it's also um, important because um, we do not expect that rule guide will, will kind of be relevant for all indications. But a couple of companies in this field that could push and develop and mature the field is very important. It's still an, an young field, uh, fluorescent guided surgery, and having a couple of players in the field would be very um, relevant to, to mature the equipment, to mature the surgeons. Um, and um, Photocube having the very first product for, for, for uh, bladder cancer, have started that for, for a long time ago. And now there's one more that will push the market, namely on target. So we think it's a very positive thing for the field. Um, and they're watching this uh, very carefully and really support what we have uh, had expectations uh, of what it would be supporting and, and approval. So we think it's a very positive thing for the field and, and for us. Okay, I, I think we're out of time. Uh, so, so with that, uh, I would like to thank you for, for participating, Morten, and I would like to thank all the uh, listeners. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening.